Welcome everyone to the SIFMA Foundation Sustainability Influ Influencer Series session number three. I'm Liz Rydell, the National Director of the SIFMA Foundation, and we are thrilled to continue our series this afternoon with a conversation with Gare Dewani, whose life experiences could span 10 lifetimes. Gare is a Sudanese-born actor, model, former child soldier, and refugee. Today, Gare works with the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees to support young refugees in their education and to bring awareness and understanding to the challenges facing displaced people across the globe. In his memoir, he writes, being a refugee forces you to remake yourself a thousand times in a thousand different ways, despite trying to hold on to some piece of yourself that you think makes you, you. We're confident Gare will inspire you to strive to be a better global citizen, to be more aware and informed, and perhaps he will even shift your mindset. To lead our conversation with Gare will be Dianara Sanchez, a senior at Urban Assembly New York Harbor School in Manhattan, New York. The youngest of two siblings, Dianara was born in Brooklyn and raised in the Bronx by her parents who emigrated from Ecuador to the United States in search of greater access to resources and opportunities for their family. Dianara's commitment to creating a sustainable planet was sparked as a result of an episode of Shark Tank and fueled her future interests in research. She is passionate about water contamination issues, primarily in urban and low income areas, deforestation, overfishing, and believes everyone has a responsibility to ensure a more sustainable future. A National Honor Society student and second place winner of an in-school symposium for marine biology students, Dianara will attend the University of Tampa in the fall and, a ma and major in marine biology and a minor in pre-veterinary science. During her free time, she enjoys hiking and mixed martial arts and hopes to be able to continue giving back to the world, making her parents transition to the United States, one they can be proud of. I'm sure they already are. Similar to our previous sessions, Gare will be taking questions from the audience. So please add any questions that you have in the chat box throughout the session. To kick things off this afternoon, we'll begin with a short overview of today's key points in the following presentation. Enjoy.
Amen. Our names are on that list. <laughs> we are going to America. Yes, hello, this is Carrie. Pick up who? I'm just supposed to help them find jobs. You must see the guys from uh, Somalia. Send a call. Sit down. Did your luggage come down the chute? Great. Where is your husband? No, I'm not married. I provide for myself. Your survival skills are very impressive. Thanks. I'll call you tomorrow morning and we'll start the job hunt. I need your help. Are there any dangerous animals in this area? Such as? Lions. <laughs> no, there's no lions here. You're safe. What's their story, anyway? I'm not sure. They seem pretty traumatized. Made my way to the borderline. I have 34 brothers and sisters, and they all gone but one. And she need to be here with us. That's gonna be a problem. All flights from the Kakuma refugee camp have been stopped. She's a child refugee of war. Since 9-11, the program here has stopped indefinitely. And you can't get involved in these people's problems. I don't think they're gonna make it if they're not together. We're in America now, and in America we are nothing. That is not true. I wonder if your church group would help me hosting a refugee. You sure you're ready to take this on? Definitely. You're being asked to make choices no one should have to make. I will pray for you, ERD. ERD? It is our special name for you. It means great white cow. Well, it's better than a lot of things I've been called. Hey! They call us the lost boy of Sudan. I don't think we are lost. I think we are found. My brothers and I prayed for a miracle, but I never expected a miracle would find us. So where do we begin? If you can get the whole house presentable, what's wrong with the rest of the house? Really? I don't know how he'll be okay, but I'll find a way. <laughs> Break into somebody's house. There is a reason you do not have a husband. Okay, thank you so much.
Hi, everyone. I hope you're doing well. Thank you so much. It's exciting to see such a large gathering for today's special event. I'm Melanie Mortimer, president of the SIFMA Foundation. The SIFMA Foundation is dedicated to advancing youth financial education, capital markets literacy, and economic mobility for youth of all backgrounds. Our educational programs have transformed the lives of over 20 million youth by providing tools for financial independence with a special focus on reaching underserved communities, girls and youth of color. Drawing on the expertise of 15,000 educators, just like many of you each year and the support of the financial industry, the SIFMA Foundation offers innovative programs that resonate with youth that connect to the real world and that fulfill national and educational, uh, state educational requirements. The SIFMA Foundation's signature program, the Stock Market Game, introduces students to the global capital markets through a, an integrated project-based curriculum and dynamic on, online market simulation. Starting with a virtual $100,000, as many of you on this call know today, student teams strive to create the best performing portfolio of stocks, bonds, ETFs, mutual funds, and now thanks to our partnership with New Day Investments, impact investments. As students manage their online portfolios, they learn things like cooperation, communication, negotiation, leadership, and they learn to follow uh, uh, current events and engage in the excitement of how the world changes. The stock market game is not only fun, but it also is proven to raise student math test scores, as well as economics and personal finance test scores. In 2018, the SIFMA Foundation decided to go on an exciting new tangent, which is to partner with New Day, an investing platform that allows users to invest in initiatives that not only bring financial returns, but also bring social return. Action areas include human rights, climate action, ocean health, animal welfare, and more. Together, we launched the Stock Market Game Sustainability Index so students can invest in ESG stocks and learn about the benefits of impact investing. And in the name of continuing in, uh, innovation, this year, 2021, we were pleased to add the SIFMA Foundation Sustainability Influencer Series. Today's conversation, which is the third in our um, influencer series, features New Day CEO Doug Heskey, an actor, activist, refugee, and UN ambassador for the High Commission on Refugees, Gair Duani. The SIFMA Foundation brings, uh, sorry, the SIFMA Foundation Sustainability Influencer Series brings together leaders in social activism, environmental conservation, and youth engagement to discuss our shared responsibility to the global community and how our investment choices can be a catalyst for positive change. We look forward to a terrific conversation today, starting with our friend, Doug Heskey, CEO of New Day. Doug is an award-winning business leader with 25 plus years in investment management. Prior to joining New Day as CEO, Doug ran the private client business for a leading responsible public finance organization. And earlier in his career, he built an impact uh, and responsible investment platform for Piper Jaffray, among many, many other accomplishments and personal attributes. But most importantly for all of us here today, Doug is a, an advocate for youth, for investor education, and for impact investing, which brought him to us several years ago and ultimately made today possible. So with no further ado, I'm going to hand it over to our friend Doug and ask him to take us through the rest of today's program. Thank you so much, Doug. Great. Melanie, thank you so much for the very warm introduction. And as we sit here now in the fifth month of the year, I should share with you that this has been one of the most exciting projects that we've been a part of over the last five months. The idea that we have this incredibly distinguished, what I would describe as superhero joining us today is just, just beyond thinking for me. And the fact that we had Philippe Cousteau and Georgie Bedell and this whole additional series of, of world recognized leaders around impact that will be joining us over the course of the next year is, is nothing short of amazing. So today's guest is going to share his story of hope 
of perseverance, of resilience, which ends up serving as an important lesson for all of us. Regardless of your privilege or lack of privilege, Gurr's story is certainly one that's gonna resonate. But before I introduce Gurr, I'd like to talk for just a moment about the intersection of today's discussion with the work of the SIFMA Foundation, the stock market game, New Day Impact, and the refugee crisis. The crisis that we're talking about is nothing short of staggering, affecting nearly every continent on earth, Europe, Asia, the Pacific, the Middle East and North Africa, and the Americas. The UNHCR estimated in June of 2020 that there are now more than 80 million, 80 million people about the population of Germany that have been forcibly, forcibly displaced. And there are over 26 million refugees. That's two and a half times the population of Sweden today. People are becoming refugees for more reasons than ever before, given growing global population combined with human conflict and then environmental change, which we are all so concerned about. And there are lots of different reasons that have been contributing to this. The five most significant ones are religious, national, social, racial, and political persecution, war, gender and sexual orientation, hunger, and then climate change. And the sad part of it is, is that the estimate is that for every one meter of sea level rise, 100 million people could be displaced over the next 50 years or so. So when we talk about sustainability and a healthy planet, we should be thinking about displaced peoples as we can't have a healthy planet without healthy humanity. And there are some really troubling statistics that everybody should be aware of. It's estimated that more than 750 million people could get pushed into extreme poverty due to climate change. And 250 more, 250 million more people could be displaced by 2050 due to rising sea levels. It's estimated that as the population grows from 7.6 billion people today to 11 billion by 2100, there could be more than a billion infants that could be born into poverty and malnutrition. And thinking about the ramifications of such a huge global problem are really staggering. So how can investing sustainability in the stock market turn things around for displaced peoples? Climate change, ocean plastics, greenhouse gas emissions are in part a collective action problem in other words, fixing these problems demands the action of citizens, governments, companies, faith-based organizations to solve. And these issues have become a defining symbol of humanity's collective relationship with the planet and one that every one of us has to address and incorporate into our daily lives. We understand that the transfer of one common share of stock from one holder to another does not necessarily translate into impact. However, investing in companies elevates the potential for every single shareholder to use their stakeholder power, demanding that morality be present in how profits are achieved and how value is created at these organizations, at these public companies. There are many companies that view the support and of hiring of refugees is not just a priority, but a really good business practice. These companies include Sodexo, which hired 300 refugees in US, Canada, Brazil, and Sweden, or Hilton Hotels, which are building on their existing efforts to impact 16,000 refugees by 2030 by providing hospitality skills training, in-kind donations, and volunteer hours to refugee organizations and offering employment opportunities. And organizations that I'm sure one that you're all familiar with, Ben & Jerry's, which is owned by Unilever, will engage their fans in campaigning for progressive policy change for refugees and asylum seekers. And at least 500 refugees will complete their business incubator program and be hired for part-time employment in Europe by 2023. And then lastly, organizations like Microsoft who will be scaling their humanitarian efforts for refugees through partnerships 
and investment that connect refugee children and young people to education. So as students, as faculty members, and as just responsible citizens, what can we be doing? We need to get informed, we need to get involved and let your voices be heard. And companies and their executives are paying attention to your opinions today. And the voices of younger people now represent more than 40% of American purchasing power just here in the US. Buy products from these companies, invest in companies that are helping develop solutions. And there's been a new focus within the capital markets as all of us know over the last few years on ESG or environmental, social and governance investing and supporting companies that are doing this really admir admirable work. In fact, just last year, we shattered all records having attracted more than $54 billion of new investment dollars into the space. And it's for great reason. Study after study has demonstrated that investors no longer have to sacrifice investment returns to invest for good. New Day's involvement in the national stock market game came about as a result of a determination that we, that all of us must be doing more to find solutions to these seemingly intractable problems. And that by owning these companies and investment portfolios, we can all generate alpha or additive returns above what a stock index might deliver. After all, making these great investments is really about selecting good companies. And good companies are often the ones that are responsible members of the corporate community. So all of this is really, really exciting news, especially as we tie this back into the subject of today. So without further ado, it is my honor and distinct privilege to introduce our friend, Gur Duwani. Gur is a survivor of the tragic exodus of an estimated 20,000 Sudanese children, often called the Lost Boys of Sudan. Born in the town of Akobo, Gur was caught up in Sudan's north-south civil war and was forcibly recruited as a child soldier. At the age of 14, he managed to escape to neighboring Ethiopia and after time in refugee camps was eventually resettled into the United States. He and I share some history, have both of us having spent some time in Connecticut. In fact, my dad actually uh, pursued his graduate degree at the same university, Bridgeport University that Gur attended as well. Today, Gur is an actor, an author, and a model, and has been appointed a UNHCR, United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, Goodwill Ambassador. So without further ado, I'd like to turn things over to Gur. Gur, great to see you, and thanks for joining the session today. It's good to see you, Doug, and I'd like to thank everybody for joining us. Sima, uh, sorry for the technical problems. I'm in South Sudan. Our network is pretty low, so... I hope you guys can put up with me. Um, well, my name is Gail Duaney and I'm from South Sudan. I was born and raised in Akoba, like Doug say. And uh, I've been away from my home country for past 28 years uh, because of the civil war. So today I wanted to share my life story, why I was, why I became a refugee or political refugees that escaped the country. Yes, being a refugee become a part of my life, of part of my journey for as long as I can remember. Uh, and that goes back into the history, a long history of civil war in this country, South Sudan or Sudan, uh, that had been happening since the 50s, uh, when my father and my mother were still very young people. So it is a war that really cost millions of lives and then I just happened to be born in it and also attend the war. And, uh, and the war that really affected my life was a war that happened in 1983 when we were displaced here in Sudan. And then we have to go to our neighbor country called Ethiopia. And then from there, we have to live in a refugee camp. But when we, are, when we were displaced from uh, South Sudan, I was living in a place called Bukteng, so a place that always stick with me so much. And I wrote about it in my books because it is more of a cattle camp mixed with a military uh, base where my father was. 
So it was that one morning when the guns start clapping and, uh, and we live on the banks of the river. The next things I know as a small boy is that we were chased away along with the military of the SPLA that was attacked by the groups of a different rebels. So I find myself, my mother and my twin brother and sister running uh, with no clothes, jumping, diving into a water and, 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 and young men were just shooting at us. And I could see the men that I was making contact with them. And many people was falling down, but we managed me and my mom. And then uh, we crossed the, the Nile River. And then from there, uh, my mom uh, could not stop uh, looking around for our father because our father was among those men who were being attacked. So this was the one ev event that I wrote about and that, I, that stayed with me the most. And that's how I was introduced to be a refugee in Ethiopia by 1987 as a small boy. And Ethiopia was a place that uh, guaranteed me stability. But I came to realize that later on that life that we were living in the refugees, uh, we were a lot of people were full of uh, frustrations because when you live in the refugee camps, you get up in the morning and you know you're doing nothing. You know? And a small fight that can really take place because of frustration, uh, you find yourself in the thick of it. And I have attended a lot of violence in the refugee camps. Each of refugee camp was a home. Some of us would really find uh, an opportunity to go to school under the tree where I have to learn uh, how to scratch my ABC in the, on the ground, which is something that always make me advocates about youth and education uh, all over the world, especially for those who are displaced or are living in the, in the camp with no mothers and fathers. So, to make this story, because it's a very long one, to make it short, uh, Ethiopia was a, a neighbor that always gave us a place where we could really regroup ourselves and also to come back to our country to liberate our nation. But in 1991, the civil war broke out in Ethiopia, which is separate from Sudan. And then uh, that's the time when I really lost contact with my mother and my father. By then I was about 13, 14. Like Doug said, uh, and that war, that's 1991 civil war in Ethiopia left, let me join the military uh, and become a child soldier where I was living in a base. Uh, and I did that just simply to survive as a small boy because we didn't have any other options of doing anything. So there's no school, there's no facility for us to learn. So everything that we were dealing with was just famine. Uh, which is something that gave me uh, an appreciation for a lot of things, you know. Uh, living in in Ethiopia and Ethiopia being destroyed by a civil war, I have, have to be in Sudan. But because the dream of me really scratching my ABC on the ground never really left me a very small boy, I decided to stay in Sudan for only one year. And then I penetrate the same path that I came through and I came back to Ethiopia. At that time, they have a new government that they were trying to establish. And I came up with the groups of guy, I think the oldest guy would have been at least about 29 to all the way down, with a few ladies, girls. So we made it to Ethiopia and that's how um, I penetrated the entire country of Ethiopia by sneaking into big trucks that can really take us to the border all the way further away by the Addis Ababa, which is a capital of, of, of Ethiopia. And then they had to take us to an area where we could walk and climb the mountains uh, to go and cross to Kenya. So from there, that's the first time I really got to see another land is called Kenya. And, uh, and then we live in a refugee camp for so long. And most of us were looking to find settlement opportunity to come to the United States because many people were looking for that. There was a lot of refugees in Rwanda. There was a lot of refugees in, uh, 
Zaire and uh, in Congo and Ethiopia. And then uh, all of us were scrapped up in one place and uh, seeking for opportunity to go abroad. Luckily, uh, I find my opportunity in 1994. Uh, I find my opportunity in 1994 uh, when my name came out of board and then I had to uh, do the process of of going to the United States and uh, in a small refugee camp again that was between Somalia and Kenya it's called Hifo refugee camp it's known for refugees with the people who established that place and then we were the people who have the opportunity to go to the United States to tell our story uh, about our lives so I got to the United States in 1994 age of 15 16 and then I went to high school state that I went to it was first it was Iowa in Des Moines, Iowa. And then I flowed around a little bit and then from there I moved from from Des Moines, Iowa and I went to South Dakota where there's other refugees because I'm used to living in a refugee camps and then being alone isolated it. I, I, I find it difficult so I had to join my other colleagues uh, to spend time there and I went to high school in, uh, in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And then that was my freshman year. So after I had finished my second, my freshman year, I didn't have another option on how to really uh, integrate myself or get involved in the United States. Life was very difficult for me. And then I had an opportunity because I have an uncle who was a professor at Indiana University and auntie. So they took me in and they told me to come to Bloomington, Indiana. And that's how I became a Hoosier. When I got to Indiana and then I, I got a hold of basketball. Basketball would become another religion for me. I played basketball in high school for three years. And then after I graduated from there, I find a scholarship to go to two year school, uh, Lakeland College. And later on, I went to LA Southwest College with another scholarship. And then uh, after I finished at LA Southwest College, and then I got another scholarship to go to University of Bridgeport to, uh, to obtain my bachelor's degree in human services. And then that's how I really got into, I got started in acting around 2003. And then more opportunity was given to me from there. So that's my, my entire journey, how I got to the United States and how I got involved in advocacy for those that I left behind. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Yeah. So, so if that if there's anyone that really have any question and that you want to know anything about my journey, it's always it's always I'm always better when a person really starts things up with a question. Well, we're excited to have Dianara kick it off and start asking you some questions. So welcome, Dianara, and feel free to go ahead and jump in with the questions for Gare. Hi, Gare. It's a pleasure to have you with us today, and as well as being able to speak with you. Um, just going back a little bit on your past, how when you were younger, at what age again did you say that you were separated from your parents? At 13. And 13, how, how did it feel being so far away from them and not really having any communication? You can only I, mean, I, was, <laughs> I was devastated, but, but I had to look beyond um, being devastated because uh, I have hopes that if they're alive and I'm alive, I will always find a way to really get to see them. And I kept that in my heart for a long time. Um, when first arriving to the U.S., what was your first impression being a 14, 15 year old going from a life so hectic to this kind of new world? Well, well everything was very strange to me. Of course, people were different and, uh, and of course, people were speaking different language and, 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 and leave alone the fact that it was very cold. So it was a, it was a huge adjustment for me. <laughs> But language was, was a crucial because I knew that if I can't learn this language, then how, how am I gonna how am I gonna navigate and how am I gonna survive? 
So the first thing I have to do is, is to learn how to speak English so that I can ask for something to eat for myself. Would you say, um, just from your perspective, one of like the biggest challenges for refugees is kind of that language barriers from when they're, tr they're being displaced from their homes? Absolutely. The language is always key for you to really survive and navigate any society. Sorry? Did I, did I answer your question? Yeah, sorry. I, it seemed like you got cut out for a second. Okay. Um, growing up in that kind of environment, what, what would you say were some definite survival skills that you definitely needed to have? My survival skills, I think, so uh, learning how to learn very fast is one of my skills, I think. And learning from other people. Yeah. Not to getting involved in things that uh, can really help me and, ha and, help my, and help the people that in my life, uh, especially those that I left behind. Um, from your perspective, what can you say, what are, are the biggest misconceptions people have from refugees? Well, the biggest misconception should be that uh, refugees are powerless. Refugees are just seeking for a handout. But one thing people don't understand is that uh, refugees, after you survive for so long, there's a, you know, you can't, you kind of develop this uh, resiliency or tolerance for just about any obstacles. And I think refugees really have that and these are skills that they should be offering to, to every society that give them an opportunity. Um, in your opinion, what do you think the U.S. should improve on when it comes to handling refugees? Well, First, I have to thank the people in the U.S. for open them up for welcoming a lot of refugees for many decades. And and if I was not really welcome in that country, and then uh, I would not be having the story to tell. You know, if improvement that needed it would be the fact that you know integration of of another person to another society. You always need like opportunity for you to learn. You know, you have to learn first. You have to create programs that really help refugees uh, to equip themselves with enough tools so that they can contribute in their society, you know, by working, by paying taxes. But when you don't have that opportunity to go to school, you can't afford the schools. It's very difficult for you to graduate. It. It's very difficult for you to obtain a job that you can really uh, earn money to just to support your family or people that are around you. So I think. Those are the things that we should be looked at uh, in order to, to improve how to integrate a refugee in a society and be a, and be a healthy city. For young, uh, for just young children and teenagers, how would you say is best for them to encounter a person who is a refugee? What would, what would your advice for them be? Can you, can you rephrase that again? For um, students who are, or just people in general, what would your advice be for when they encounter a refugee? What, how do you think that they should go about it? Well, well, first refugees, they have to know that they are not what they've been told, you know? They are not what they've been told that you are just a refugee. First, you have to be a human being. So every single time that you encounter or you meet a refugee, it's not just a refugee. You just have to know that you met a person and it is a person that you never know what you can learn from them. And, and what they can learn from you would be even more important too, because you, you both are humans. And I think that would be a good beginning to start a good conversation from there. That's very beautiful. Um, my, like my father, he also uh, immigrated from Ecuador and coming and he all often told me about how people would kind of have this speculation about how they constantly wanted, people who are coming to here wanted to take jobs, but they forget that it's just a, such a struggle just to even get here in the first place. That's right. so, um, 
Going towards your book, you recently came out with Walk Towards the Rising Sun. What would you say was your main goal out of that book? What, what was my what? What was your main goal in writing the book? Oh, well, right, Walk Towards the Rising Sun is a story that has been living with me for so many years. You know, and honestly, it started to take over my life. And then uh, when that opportunity came, and that I had to really sit and, and, and gather my thoughts, I mean, it took me a long time. You know, it took me about 16 years to really, uh, you know, refine myself about who I am and, and, and you know, and, and try to learn about where in the world that I can fit to be, to serve just about any, you know, to serve other people because uh, that's what my work is about. That's what my life journey is about, is to serve. So when I'm writing, when I was writing that book, it just came. And, and, and then I just, I just had to get it out of me. And then I had to share with the other people, you know. Uh, but it had to take some time. It took some time, a good five years of really writing it. And then also more research for 16 years. Um, just shifting gears a little bit, what you would, what would your advice be for um, students who are kind of going into the real world? And, um, What's my advice for? For uh, students and just young adults who are going, just shifting gears a little bit, going into the real world. Well, well you know, being asked an advice is like very uh, flattering. One, but one thing that I know about young people, you guys have a lot of guys are very smart and I think the young person should always take the chance to just about anywhere around the world and just try to learn as much as possible and once you can really put yourself with a lot of tools and educate yourself and update your world views and then I think you become a, a person uh, that is all way around and then uh, the world will become a place for you where you can just settle about anywhere so I think to learn as much as possible would be something that all of us really needed, it. not only young people, young and old, and, and anybody in between. Um, during your Waffle House interview, you were, um, what kind of, like, that's amazing. What kind of advice would you also give to students who are, for example, their first interviews for their jobs? Uh, I, don't, I don't think I understand the question. Can you repeat that again? Repeat it. Um, during your Waffle House interview, what advice would you give for students who are interviewing for their first jobs? Would you say it's putting yourself out there? Well, I think it's really important when a person doing an interview, you have to show up. You know, you show up and then you have to be honest, and be honest with the people. People can see. Uh, if you are an honest person and if you are not an honest person, it is all in the eye. It is not nowhere. It's not about what you say. Yeah. So always have that confidence about yourself because you know you can do anything with a young person. Well, it's been a pleasure talking with you, Gare. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak with you. Um, right now we're going to be switching it over to the Q&A and I'll be handing it back to Liz. Good talking to you. Excellent. Diana. Thank you so much, Dianara and Gare. We are excited. We have a lot of awesome questions for you um, from the audience. And one that stuck out um, is from Rick Page. And I thought it was an excellent question. And his students were worried about you, worried about you having missed out on your childhood, being a child soldier. Now that you're an adult, is that how you feel or do you see your childhood differently? No, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see my childhood. Uh, I don't see myself like I, I miss out my, on my childhood. And, uh, and I, I, th I thought I had a great uh, childhood, even though the civil war was happening, we tend to manage to live our lives at the same time. And then I, I had a fantastic time as a child. I swim a lot. I'm a, I'm a guy who loves to swim. I, I enjoy being around my, my cattle and, uh, 
I enjoy uh, harvesting times uh, in my village. I enjoy a lot of festiv festivities. And then also when the war come, and then it is another thing. So I, I think I had, a, I had a, a decent childhood. Excellent, I like that question. Um, let's see. Um, when you first came to the United States, what was what do you think was the biggest adjustment you had to make besides learning English? The biggest adjustment, I think, getting used to living without my mom and my dad, I have to accept the fact that they're not going to be here with me. And I have to accept the fact that this is my new country. This is a new place for the new opportunity for me. And let me just try to stay as focused as possible so that I can learn something. Maybe one day I can learn how to read and write and then maybe I can go back and help someone. And then maybe that's, that's the core of my entire journey. And then, uh, and even though I didn't see my mom and my dad for 20 years, I keep thinking about them, but I didn't lose focus to be in the States and and try to, try, try to educate myself. Well, a lot of people are asking if you've been reunited with your family. Are your family um, with you? Are, have you um, been able to see them? What, what has happened with your family? Oh yes, my, I have united with my family uh, in 2010 uh, before uh, independence of my, our new country and it became an independent nation. And then, uh, but some of the family that was alive, we, we met and some of the family that uh, did not make it, I, they didn't make it. And um, my mom, my dad, my dad is here right now. And uh, my mom died like uh, four years ago uh, with a colon cancer in Nairobi, Kenya, where I, I buried her. So I'm in peace. Uh, some of my family with the current civil war in South Sudan, uh, most, most of them, they live in the refugee camps in all the East African country because I come from a big family. If you read my story, I have at least about 63 brothers and sisters. And then uh, most of them, they-, they Oh, never, I think here ever... we're having somebody. You hear me? Hello? Yes, yep. So I have a big family. So people are still living outside the country. Uh, from the current civil war that happened like seven years ago. Where do you live now? I think you mentioned it, but a couple people were curious about where you are right now. Now, right now, in the meantime, I'm in a mission in the Republic of South Sudan. I'm in Juba and I've been here for the past four months. And uh, that's my first time coming back in my country since the war broke out in 2013. So I'm here my family and uh and we just watching how things are unfolding in the new nation um one question that a couple of teachers had sent actually before the session and this is perfect for teachers um as they're reviewing this session with their students that they get asked a lot what do you recommend to high school students or just students in general who want to get involved with refugees and just want to help out as much as possible? What can they do? Well, I think there's so many things that we can do. Uh, and having a conversation like this and, uh, and the student themselves having projects that are group projects and, uh, and then uh, try to learn from one another and also try to read other people's stories and share their own stories. And those are the things that I can really recommend uh, for a student when they are learning so that you can, you never know what you can come across just from someone's story that uh, may come from a different place. And your story obviously is so inspirational to so many people who inspires you? What makes you, what keeps you going? What drives you? And, and who's that inspiration for you? I, I, I'm, a, I'm a very curious person and, uh, since I was a child. And 
and then uh, I, th I think it's something and people that really is there's so many people that really inspire me all across the world I can't even name any, <laughs> one person but it's just so many things so I'm always full of life and I'm always curious and I was and I'm a very adventure person by nature and, and that give me um, energy to really uh, think about creative get interested in the creative projects and uh, they get me going so I have plenty of people that I learn from and I have a lot of people who are very smart and then they just teach me a lot of things awesome so one of the things that we are kind of bummed about that our video at the beginning of this session we included a trailer to your movie a good lie and for anyone who's on the call, if you haven't watched it, we strongly, strongly recommend you watching it. It tells the story of the Lost Boys of Sudan. Um, so many of our attendees are curious, how did you get involved in acting? So when you uh, came to the United States, you're a basketball player, how, how did you make that um, segue into acting? <laughs> well, I, did, I got my first acting job in 2003. From a, from a movie called I Heart Huckabees uh, with a director named David O. Russell. He's a fantastic filmmaker, he's well known across America. He does good work when it comes to films. And then he decided to cast me. He decided to cast me uh, and um, say he's looking for a guy who had really life experiences as a refugee. But other than that, I didn't have a dream to be an actor at all. So that came accidentally and then I I was casted among many people, and then I became, uh, and I was in that movie. So that was another opportunity for me. And uh, yeah, that's how I start. Well, it was a beautiful story and we were, it was just amazing. And it did such a great job telling the story of the Lost Boys of Sudan. So Gare, we so appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to talk with everyone who's on the call, provide inspiration. Um, so again, we are so happy that you were so open and, um, and, and shared your experiences with us, so thank you. And I'll turn it back now to Melanie Mortimer, um, who will close out the session for us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gare. Oh, oh no, have we already reached that point? Um, Gare, we could listen to you telling your story and your incredible experiences for hours. Um, somehow you make what is a truly heart-wrenching personal history become heartwarming. And that is such a gift. Clearly that's how you have risen to become um, a UN Goodwill Ambassador. You carry that in your spirit and your heart and your conversation and clearly from the impact that you've had on us, everything that you do. And we're grateful for you. You are truly a, a global treasure. We're so inspired and humbled that you spent your afternoon with us today. And we look forward to following you um, long into the future. Uh, and we're gonna be looking for more coming out of um, all of the different realms of, of your life and your work. Thank, thank you, thank you, Melinda. Thank you, Liz. Appreciate you guys. I also want to say thank you to Dionara Sanchez for your excellent interview questions. You really uplifted today's theme and also, of course, our guest speaker, Gerdwani, so beautifully. Thank you for your preparation and joining us here and being an inspiration to your fellow students. Um, Doug and your New Day team, thank you so much for all that you do. As I've said before, this is a partnership that continues to blossom. And we have a lot more ahead of us um, that I think this audience is going to be staying tuned for as soon as we share some really exciting news about that. Uh, of course, to Liz and my foundation colleagues, Sarah Bryant, Perrine Kohlhaas, and the many others who made today um, possible, thank you for your contributions. Uh, we are going to be providing a playback of the recording and additional um, resources for all the who have taken part, and uh, we'll be sharing that broadly in the next couple of days. Students, thank you for your incredible questions. Uh, I was trying to keep track of all of them as we went along and they, they were popping faster than popcorn today. So if we didn't cover any and we can do a reprise, uh, rest assured that we will try to get those um, answers to you. 
Um, and of course, I want to say thank you to all of our fearless, brilliant stock market game teachers for persevering through a really challenging school year and continuing to invest in your students' participation in the stock market game and namely today's program. Thank you so much for all that you do. We hope you've enjoyed this third edition of the SIFMA Foundation Sustainability Influencer Series with the amazing Gerdwani. I encourage you to continue learning about um, the UN High Commission on Refugees and Gerdwani at www.gerdwani.com. With this three-day weekend coming up, I also um, encourage you, if you haven't already seen his movie, I uh, strongly recommend watching A Good Lie or reading Gare's phenomenal book, Walk Towards the Rising Sun. For more information and resources about New Day Impact's work, please visit www.newdayimpact.com. And of course, to participate in the stock market game or get more information about the work of the SIFMA Foundation, please visit us at www.stockmarketgame.org. Now, as we officially close today's session, let me remind you to keep investing in your education, in your community, in the causes you care about, and of course, in yourselves. Thank you so much. Have a great day, everyone.